Hello. Hello Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day, where we talk about the American Revolution all the time. This is our weekly wrap-up where I will be reviewing the stories and founders that I spoke about over the course of the last seven days and videos here on YouTube, as well as uh, articles published at founderoftheday.com. There's already a bunch of people here. I see a bunch of likes. Thank you so much. As you roll in, definitely hit like. Uh, why don't you leave a comment? Let me know you're here. If you have any questions, now's the time to talk about it. I uh, My videos are very short, as are my articles throughout the week. So this one, if you had any further questions, I will do my best to answer them. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for showing up. Uh, Ashley, you're going to be excited. We are going to be talking about one of the worths today. Uh, as you, those of you who come play trivia on Fridays, you might know, uh, Ashley's usually the one who does a run on the Worths, the Bloodworths, and the Wentworths, and the Wadsworths, which we are going to be discussing a little bit later. Uh, but let's get it kicked off. People seem to be already here. Thank you all for hitting like as you come on in. Let's pop up our first founder, which of course is not a founder. It's the Federal Farmer, number five. So as you probably know, every Friday I spent a year and a half doing the Federalist Papers, and today we are doing, or right now we're going through the Anti-Federalist Papers. YouTube is telling me my bitrate is a little low, so hopefully you're seeing me just fine, fine, just fine. Uh, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> um, uh, but we are going through the Anti-Federalist Papers. Turn my volume down a little bit, don't want to be too loud for you. Oh. The Anti-Federalist Papers that we're discussing is Federal Farmer number 5. Now, Federal Farmer, as we've been discussing, was probably Melanchthon Smith of New York, though we'll never know for sure. And Smith writes these first five papers, and it's fine. Uh, and then it, it's actually wildly successful. And starting next week, although I'm publishing a video and article on it tomorrow, uh, we're going to number six. Thanks for letting me know, Ashley. Great to know. Um, basically... Uh, the Federal Farmers, the first five essays, or observations as he calls them, were wildly successful, made a ton of money. So the following uh, January, they decided to publish a whole bunch more. And the rest are not as good, but they are very important, so we will go through them. And I do see myself delaying a little bit, but that's okay. Hi, TJ. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, if my lips are not matching up my voice, hopefully it sounds fine. <laughs> um... Hopefully YouTube will catch up. So, Federal Farmer number five. Again, this is supposed to be the last of the Federal Farmers written in October of 1787, just a, less than a month after the, the Constitution is first published. So, uh, this paper has a, is a little bit more conciliatory than we're used to from either the Federal Farmer or Anti-Federalist in general. You see, he kind of has a tone, an overture of defeat. Uh, he seems to know that the Constitution is going to pass in some fashion. So, what he basically says right off the bat is a little surprising. He acknowledges the Articles of Confederation need to change, which most anti-federalists did. Well, most everyone knew that some change was needed. So, uh, he also says, surprisingly, that there are some very good things in the United States Constitution. Yes, that very Constitution that he's trying to stop from happening, though... He's no longer trying to stop it from happening. What he now goes into is trying to get amendments passed. And we all know that what would happen is the Constitution would be ratified. And because there was such an outcry by these anti-federalists, the Bill of Rights would be the first 10 amendments that would be passed within three years. What the federal farmer begins to recommend is that when states ratify the Constitution, 
they say that their ratification is incumbent upon the passing of certain amendments. And he does enumerate these a little bit, but we get a little bit more into that uh, tomorrow uh, or in the, in the next federal farmer paper. Uh, he then goes on to talk about faction. And again, faction is what they called party back then. So, uh, you know, when, when I say the word faction, think political parties, but just under a different banner. Uh, he points out two factions, uh, the lawless rebels, uh, who he specifically references as Shazites in reference to Shays rebellion, which had just happened in Massachusetts the year before. Um, and other outbreaks like this had been happening around. Now the wealthy elite among whom the federal farmer counted himself, uh, and most anti-federalist authors counted themselves among the, the elites. They didn't like this recklessness, this wild open behavior, um, what they called anarchy, although uh, the word anarchy has evolved over time and, and they meant it as basically lawlessness. He, he thought they were radicals. He thought they were just had didn't want to follow any rules and that was no good. But he also didn't like what he called the aristocrats. And those were the people and he specifically names Pennsylvania, though there are other federalists who he would count among them. Uh, those who among the elites like himself but who just didn't want, uh, just didn't want any form of democracy or republicanism. Basically, as close to monarchy as the United States was going to get. Uh, they just wanted all the power and all the money under the control of a handful of people. Uh, and and what the old farmer says is, is really interesting. He basically says, caught in the middle of all this is most people. <laughs> most people didn't want. Uh, just one small group of powerful elites to run everything. And they also didn't want lawlessness. Most people had different views on things, but most of And I don't talk about modern politics here, but it's a little bit, you know, uh, I feel very similar to the federal farmer in that aspect. <laughs> most people just don't have the loudest microphones. And that unfortunately seemed to him to be what was happening at the time is the people with the loudest microphones were on the extremes making a big ruckus and everyone else was getting papooed over it so to speak now uh, again he goes back from there into talking about amendments and he says on behalf of these people these reasonable people in the middle who understand a change needs to happen the constitution has some good stuff but there are some corrections that have to be made therefore he pleads to the delegates to the ratification conventions when you go Please, if you decide to vote for the Constitution, tell the world that these changes have to be made. And and these are right, things that we're, we're super accustomed to now. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, uh, right to bear arms, the necessity of militia, um, the right to a fair trial, a speedy trial, a public trial, so a trial close to your house. Um, uh, uh, the other amendments, you know, don't quarter troops in my house. Like these are all things that are not in the constitution <laughs> that we take for granted now, but the anti-federalists made such a big stink about these rights as they saw them not being protected under the constitution. Well, James Madison had to get to work when he finally gets to the house of representatives. Uh, and that's a really brief overview of the uh, Federal Farmer number five, his fifth set of observations. So let's get into some of the fun stories. Unless you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, but let's get into the fun stories. Like Christopher Leffingworth. Leffingworth? Leffingworth. Christopher Leffingworth brought dessert to the Continental Army. So as crazy as that sounds, uh, Christopher Leffingworth, by the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, is already one of the wealthiest people in Connecticut. Um, his, uh, he was from Norwich, I believe, and his, his like, great-grandfather had founded Norwich, was one of the original proprietors of the Connecticut colony, which at one point was kind of two colonies, but that's a hundred years before the time we're discussing. Either way, Leffingworth is very rich. He owns a bunch of different proto-factories, I'll call them. You know, this... Again, the American Revolution is at the peak of the Enlightenment, as I like to say, and and by the, as, between the Declaration of Independence and George Washington's presidency, the Enlightenment has begun to give way to the Industrial Revolution. So he already owns a bunch of operations that are more or less factories, though not in the fashion we currently think of them. One of these was a paper manufacturer. Now, 
when the Stamp Act came around 10 years before the Revolutionary War began, and people were complaining that they needed a stamp on every piece of paper, it's easy to forget that the people who made paper were particularly upset about this. Of course, most paper was shipped in from overseas, but Connecticut had one paper manufacturer, and that was Christopher Leffingwell. And he, as I said, owned a bunch of different types of factories. He owned a cloth factory and, and a sugar refinery, which we'll get to. But when one of the richest people in the colony now has one of their major businesses being interrupted because of these new taxes, he wasn't happy about it. Now, Christopher Leffingwell was friendly with Governor Jonathan Trumbull. And Governor Jonathan Trumbull ends up being the only royal governor who sticks around with the Patriots and continues as a Patriot governor and continues in his position from before times to the after times. And uh, it seems that not all of it, but a good portion of this, uh, his early uh, inclination to stick with the Patriots was his good buddy Christopher Leffingwell flashing money around saying, hey, Johnny, not cool. So as the war gets started, Lexington and Concord happens, and then Benedict Arnold, at this point not a traitor, and not yet an American hero either, he gets this bright idea to go invade Fort Ticonderoga, you know, a British-held fort in New York State. I'm not going to get too much into that, but one of the people who pays out of his pockets to support the taking of Ticonderoga in early 1775, just weeks after Lexington and Concord, it is Christopher Leffingwell. And actually, Silas Dean, who I talk about here a lot, who ends up really getting... Uh, he, Silas Dean is an American hero who doesn't get the credit at the time that I am trying to give him now, and several authors are trying to give him now. Uh, they pay out of their pocket to fund Benedict Arnold to go up to Fort Ticonderoga, of course, without an army, where he runs into the Green Mountain Boys of Vermont and Ethan Allen, who have a small army, but that army doesn't think they're New York or New Hampshire. It's a very interesting situation. No one gets along with Benedict Arnold because Benedict Arnold says, well, I have money from Connecticut and I'm commissioned by Massachusetts, so I'm in charge. And Ethan Allen was like, literally said, you and what army? Like, this is my army. You're not in charge of it. Anyway, back to Leppingwell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, speaking of armies, Leffingwell ends up... Um, after Lexington and Concord, I actually skipped this. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord, uh, there's a famous ride that's not quite as famous as certain other rides. A gentleman named Israel Bissell is given what's called the Lexington Alarm, which was a piece of paper that said, hey, the war broke out in Lexington, and he was supposed to ride to Philadelphia to tell the Second Continental Congress, which was just starting to get together to meet. Uh, he actually was supposed to race ahead of Sam Adams and John Hancock, who were pretty near to the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Um, he rides this ride in five days. It's amazing. And along the way, what he gets signatures from different towns. He goes from town to town. He goes south. I think two people were sent out, but he's the more famous ride because he goes south through Rhode Island, through Connecticut, through to New York City, through New Jersey, to Pennsylvania, stopping at towns along the way and warning the, leader of the, the leaders of those towns, at which point the leaders of those towns would sign or attest a.k.a. be a witness to this document, because there was a pretty good chance someone in eastern Connecticut knew the gentleman in western Rhode Island who signed it and could attest that, okay, this is official, and send it on its way, as opposed to someone in New York City just taking the word of a writer from uh, Boston. Okay, man, you know, what makes it, how do I know you didn't just write this letter, right? I bring this up because along the way, Christopher Leffingwell is one of the handful of men in Norwich, Connecticut, that Bissell meets with, shows the paper, says war is broken out, and Leffingwell attests to that document and then sends him on his way down to Philadelphia. Um, and it was a few weeks after that that he raises the money for Benedict Arnold, but it's almost immediately he starts raising money for Connecticut, and he supplies Connecticut um, with the Connecticut militia. He takes over essentially as a quartermaster general for the Connecticut militia, um, though unofficial. Um, furthermore, he uses his factories, uh, his paper factory. He makes uh, shell casings, which he gives to both Connecticut militia and the Continental Army, and his sugar refinery makes chocolate. 
that they give as rations to the Continental Army. Now, the Continental Army often had times where they couldn't get anything through to feed them. But from time to time, the Continental Army soldiers were able to eat chocolate. I want to say for dessert, because that's how we view chocolate nowadays, but no, at the time, I think there's a good chance they just took whatever they could eat and ate it. Uh, but still, Christopher Leffingworth gave what I call dessert to the Patriots in the Continental Army. Because of this work, uh, he was noticed um, by... Uh, nope, I almost jumped ahead to Wentworth. Uh, we're about to talk to about another Connecticut man who helped feed the army just after this one. Whoopsie daisy. But he did, uh, Leffingworth does work closely with Commissary General uh, Joseph Trumbull, son of Jonathan Trumbull, the governor who he was friends with, so his buddy's kid, uh, and Quartermaster General Thomas Mifflin throughout the war. And does a great job, a tremendous job, of uh, helping to feed and supply, uh, as I said, the Connecticut militia and the Continental Army as much as he could. Now, uh, he does serve as a colonel briefly in the war, but he doesn't really lead any men. It's kind of, I don't call it an honorary title. He does have the title of colonel, but hes it's more because he's doing these uh, important uh, commissary-type work. Uh, after the war ends, he, as I said, the Industrial Revolution's coming. And Leffingwell is already well-placed to jump into the Industrial Revolution because he already has a bunch of proto factories around and he invests in actual factories he's actually one of the first men to show interest in bringing a spinning jenny to the united states which ends up being a really important uh cloth making tool that um grows the united states a lot of early factories in the more modern fashion that we would recognize it or i guess i should say the more uh eight nineteenth 19th century uh pre wage rules, a pre-labor union way that we think of it, even post-labor union way. Um, he doesn't end up bringing that over, but he is the first person to really seriously talk to England about bringing one over. Uh, but he does end up uh, um, adding more and more factories. As I said, the, the types of factories are escaping me, but he really diversifies his portfolio, as they say, uh, and ends up having just a ton of different factories throughout Connecticut that eventually lead to as I said, the Industrial Revolution, at least as it goes in Connecticut. Now, he ends up spending the last few years of his life in kind of a semi-retirement, but he donates a lot of his money to help improve his town. At the time, governments didn't do a lot of interior improvements, uh, and he ends up building roads, bridges, and even at least one lighthouse to help industrialize Connecticut and to make more profits for his state and for himself. So that is Christopher Leffingworth, um, and the image I have next to me is actually his house, which still stands. I was reached out to a while ago when I, I, I had spoken about him before. I, I probably should reach out to them down in Connecticut. Uh, you can still take tours of this house if you are in the area, so check it out. Uh, the Leffingworth Museum, I believe it is. Leffingworth Mansion Historical Site. It's table, it's just Google Christopher Leffingworth. It's the first thing that comes up after Wikipedia, I, I assure you. And what, I mean, hopefully after Founder of the Day, that's what I'm going for. There are a few randos like this that I actually am the number one Google search on, which is, if I can toot my own horn for a second, super cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on to another Founder. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water because I'm getting hot over here. As usual, I had to turn off my AC and the cat kicked open the door right away. So all my cold air left me. And yet I've committed to the flannel look for these shows. <laughs> despite my better judgment. Anyway, Jeremiah Wadsworth. Hey, Ashley, here's the worth we were talking about before. Jeremiah Wadsworth, who goes on to be a commissary general in the Continental Army. Now, <coughs> excuse me, whoopsie daisy. <coughs> a little congested, a little congested. Um, Jeremiah Wadsworth, he was from a fairly wealthy Connecticut family. I guess I shouldn't wave my hand in front of the camera because now I look blurry. Let's see if we can't fix that really super quick for you guys. I guess I should leave the configure video thing open. Oh, oh, there I am. Yeah, let's apply it. All right, now that that's out of the way, uh, Jeremiah Wadsworth was born to a fairly wealthy Connecticut family uh, and they owned a bunch of merchant ships and he actually takes to the sea as a young man and becomes a captain of one of these merchant ships, travels around, uh, learns how money's made, makes some money of his own, enough to go back to Connecticut and start his own business, his own merchant firm, where he hired people to be captain of his ships. Uh, when the revolution breaks out, he already has 
a ton of money. <laughs> and uh, he has a tiny little fortune. Um, and he, like our previous person, Christopher Leffingworth, from Connecticut and helps to build uh, uh, Connecticut. Actually, he might also be from Norwich. They might be from the same place. Um, but he uh, helps to fund the Connecticut militia. As I love to say on this channel, uh, the American Revolution was not just the Continental Army versus the British Army. Uh, there were 13 separate state militias and the state militias essentially acted as independent armies rhode island also had a little actually official army and a state militia plus you got the green mountain boys in vermont uh you've got uh the 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 western the ohio valley region the daniel boones and uh more daniel morgans of the world kind of their own thing out there so plus the french and spanish and the dutch come in eventually it's a lot of armies involved and connecticut more or less had its own army in its militia and jeremiah wadsworth starts using his uh, ships and know-how and finances to supply the connecticut militia he does a really good job and george washington takes notice and gw ends up uh telling continental congress jeremiah wadsworth is the guy to become commissary general of the militia now we had mentioned before uh joseph trumbull a son of jonathan trumbull governor of connecticut was commissary general but he only does this briefly uh he leaves for illness if i'm my mind's remembering correctly i believe he's the trumbull boy who passes away fairly quickly and young sadly um one of them did i think it was joseph <clears throat> excuse me again uh jeremiah wadsworth takes over that position and he spends several years uh, funding, supplying the Continental Army. And again, it was always trouble <laughs> to feed and clothe the Continental Army, uh, but he takes charge of that. And he does a fairly good job considering the circumstances he was given. What he also does is he makes a fortune. Now, this was not uncommon at the time. It could be looked down upon depending on who you were. Like, essentially, he made a ton of money off it because he and no one cared. And then Benedict Arnold moves into Philadelphia and does more or less the same thing uh and everyone cares now that is a different situation and i don't i i don't like to defend brendan Arnold here if you're new to the channel i do call him an american hero all the time because he was that's what makes his treason so important uh but uh wadsworth makes a fortune as commissary general feeding and clothing the continental army and then he leaves uh and then what happens well I want to make sure I don't say the wrong thing here. Yes, uh, he leaves the Continental Army because he's done with that. And then the French show up and the French need someone to help them get supplies in America. And they arrive in Rhode Island, which is right next to Connecticut. And Jeremiah Wadsworth like, yo, Frenchie, I'll help you out. And he does. And he spends the remainder of the war, less four years of the war, as cop not commissary general to the French because he's not French and can't have that title in the army, but more or less the American counterpart for the commissary general. And if you think he made money feeding the Continental Army, well, those French dudes were just throwing cash around. So Jeremiah Wadsworth gets real wealthy. And then the war ends, and he stays with the French until 1783. So all the way until they, they leave, till not only do, not only till they leave, but the whole evacuation of Manhattan and the re resignation of G General Washington. He then goes back to his fortune for a while, invests it, does real good, and then the United States Constitution is ratified at the end of the 1780s. And Jeremiah Wadsworth is actually elected as one of the inaugural congressmen to go to the United States House of Representatives. Um, I don't remember the exact number of that first cr class of congressmen. Um, I believe it was like 33 or something like that. Um, and Wadsworth is one of those lucky few to be an original member of the United States House of Representatives. Now, the last thing he's kind of known for is as a peace commissioner. So Wadsworth makes all this money and he has he, he ends up speculating in land in what we would now consider Western New York, everything from Rochester out to Pennsylvania um, or like Erie, Pennsylvania. I mean. um, he speculates in this land. He has two nephews he sends out there to essentially make it, uh, one of which builds a house out of cobblestone. And cobblestone became a very frequently, uh, 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 cobblestone ends up, there's a lot of cobblestone houses in upstate New York, uh, western Pennsylvania, and parts of the, the um, what was then the Northwest Territory, the Ohio Valley, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. They all have a good amount of cobblestone houses that still 
stand because stone is really sturdy and that's why they used it and it's actually wadsworth's nephew who i'm sorry the name is escaping me um but uh, i have written about him I mean, his first name escapes me but i uh, his his nephew while working for him out in that area ends up building the first cobblestone house and starting kind of an early like architectural trend even though it's not architectural this is a time on the frontier where people went out and just cut down some trees and built a house well word got around that wadsworth's nephew had dug up some stones and built a house and that kind of became the fad for a while uh so fun fact for you that's a super fun fact now this land as i said it's in upstate new york western new york um i the native americans in that area were the um the Iroquois, the Iroquois Nation, which were actually six nations, they broke up during the Revolutionary War, had a civil war after arguably, a th or I shouldn't say arguably, possibly a thousand years of peace. Um, and they didn't leave the land right away. The ones who sided with the Americans were supposed to have kept their land, did for a while. The ones who fought with the British against the Americans, they were supposed to get up and leave. Uh, and uh, there is a gentleman named Isaac Smith that George Washington, now president, ends up a point, uh, turns down. An appointment by George Washington. Uh, so Washington goes with the second choice, Jeremiah Wadsworth. Now Wadsworth had owned all the huge amount of land. It's hard for me to even describe. Like if you look at a map of New York, it looks like a boot and it's everything underneath Lake Ontario. It's just a huge amount of land. Um, since he owns it, George Washington goes, hey, Wadsworth, why don't you go out? And he does. He goes out and they sign a treaty called the Treaty of Big Tree which, uh, you know, looking back historically, maybe not uh, the most generous treaty to the Native Americans. Um, uh, and, and, you know, obviously talking about treaties, Native Americans and land can get a little dicey, especially because there are so many different Native American nations that had their land taken in different ways at different times by different people. Uh, this group in particular had just lost a war to the Americans. Uh, so they're... I don't want to say they were justified in how the negotiations went down, but uh, they definitely were not super lenient to the Native Americans. They did get reservations, of course. Most of them end, ended up going uh, further west. Uh, many would... Um, uh, th this is about the time that the uh, 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 Northwest Indian War concludes. So many of them end up going out that way. Um, Yada, yada, yada. But Jeremiah Wadsworth, I'm sorry, I don't mean to yada, yada, yada Native American history, but I'll yada this particular treaty, because uh, we've talked about Wadsworth for a while now. Jeremiah Wadsworth uh, goes out to the land he owns for the only time in his life to negotiate this treaty, and then goes back to Connecticut to be super wealthy, um, and he spends time in the local Connecticut government. He spends time on the um, executive council, which was kind of like a mixture of a cabinet and a state senate. So, um... That's that. Now, I do see a question coming in from Ashley. How exactly did it go about getting food for the army? Did the food mainly come from farms, merchants, store owners, etc.? That's a great question. Um, so, as for Wadsworth, uh, I don't know all the details about he went about it, but I do know in general how it went down. First of all, for, most, for a good portion of the war, Continental Congress had given George Washington essentially dictatorial powers. Uh, and the reason for this was actually food. Uh, and clothing uh, because they said if you got to go take it from farmers go take it now Washington tried his best not to do that um, but they, they usually called it forage uh, they would go and take what they had to uh, they would usually try and pay the so the farmers although it was often in uh, continentals which had no value anyway but he tried his best um, Wadsworth would have gone through being in Connecticut and sending it over. He probably would have purchased most of it. Now, they would have purchased a lot of it from farmers. Uh, to be fair, farmers did try and raise their price knowing where it was going. I mean, you know how people like taking advantage of government contracts is not a new thing. Uh, he would get many of it, uh, uh, not just from merchants, uh, the store owners not so much because the store owners were really competing with him for the food to sell to local residents. Uh, Wadsworth, with his shipping connections, would have definitely gone and gotten uh, from, uh, imported it. Now, France, even before they join the war, they are secretly selling goods to the Americans through Silas Dean, who I mentioned over in uh, France before Ben Franklin shows up. Um, 
many people on the in the Caribbean. Uh, so not just France, but Spain would have been importing food. And um, uh, uh, um, I don't know if the Dutch sent food. I know the Dutch gave us a lot of money. I don't know if they uh, would have sent food. Um, but it was more of a uh, 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 bringing the food sources together and getting it to the Continental Army than really finding the food. You know, he would have had delegates or, or, or deputies, I should say, go out and help him get this stuff. Um, most of it was from farmers. Uh, most people throughout all of human history, including the American Revolution, were farmers. 80 to 90 percent of all people in America were farmers. Um, well, okay, I, I let me retrace that. About one-fifth of the population were slaves, and I, it's hard to count them as farmers uh when they were work they were working on plantations but uh we'll say 80 to 90 percent of the free population were human farmers mostly just grew their own food kept to themselves uh did a little extra work on the side or grew some extra food to sell to market to pay their taxes and buy some things and go about their life that's how most of human history has worked actually we live in the most luxurious time in human history right now um that being said uh, yeah, just to sum up the, the answer to your question, mostly from farmers, but a good amount would have also been imported um, either through his merchant business or smuggled in. Because it's not like smuggling stopped once independence was declared. Uh, they liked smuggling. <laughs> Many of the American founders really liked smuggling. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I'm not, uh, I will say, I'm certainly not an expert on how they recruited food from Connecticut. Uh, I can talk a lot, as we've talked about recently, I can talk a lot about getting food in New Jersey <laughs> and the forage wars and how it was a problem. But uh, please let me know if you have another question and we'll move on to our next founder. Who is it? Gaylord Griswold. Gaylord Griswold. The man who drafted the 12th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Let's talk about Griswold. So, first of all, I'm just now realizing I talked a lot about Connecticut this week. I did not do that on purpose. Gaylord Griswold was also from Connecticut. He was from a very wealthy... I talk about Connecticut a lot today. We're doing almost all Connecticut with two exceptions. Whoopsie doodle. <laughs> I'll just pretend that didn't happen. Um, Griswold is from the Griswold family. And no, I don't believe Clark Griswold is related because Clark Griswold is an imaginary figure from some of the best movies of the 1900s. I was going to say 1980s. I'm going to one-up you. The 1900s, the vacation movies. Uh, I'm a fan of the first one. The moose says you're closed. I say you're open. <laughs> uh, the Griswold family is a really wealthy family from Connecticut. Uh, they actually, to sidestep uh, Gaylord for a second here, uh, they were... Uh, Matthew Griswold was a governor of Connecticut during the revolution. Uh, his son, uh, first name escapes me, who would also be governor, is the man who would cane, like literally got in a fight and hit Matthew Lyon in the face with his cane, which I can tell that story if you like uh, when we get through here. Um, <laughs> on the floor of Congress, uh, another one was, they were just really important to Connecticut and then go to Vermont to New York. And then eventually over the years following the American founding, the Griswold family ends up being important in, in the iron industry. Uh, and one of them makes the first ironclad, I think it's called the Monitor, which was an ironclad ship, which made it a lot harder to sink during the Civil War. So a really important family. Gaylord is actually kind of one of the side members of this family, uh, though he comes of age after the war ends, so he doesn't actually fight in the war, but he goes to Yale and graduates and begins practicing just as the uh, America, uh, the, the uh, Constitution is ratified. Now, he does, I believe, I don't remember if he ran for any positions in Connecticut, but as a young man, he ends up going to New York, upstate New York. Again, we're back here. Uh, now that I'm saying it, literally everyone but one is Connecticut or upstate New York. Anyway, uh, he moves to Herkimer, New York, which in, at the time, again, was the frontier, though not the furthest to the frontier, um, not as far as the Treaty of Big Treaty, Big Tree that we were discussing before. Uh, he becomes a lawyer 
And as you know, since the Native Americans had just recently relocated, uh, the population is rapidly growing. So he, they need law lawyers, and he takes advantage and makes a lot a lot of money early. Um, and he's then sent, but the, before he even turns thirty, he's sent to the New York State Assembly, and he starts making a name for himself. Uh, until 1803, when he's elected as a Federalist to the United States House of Representatives. Uh, I want to make note that New York at this point was still what we would consider a swing state. That's why, as I've said a lot recently, you get a lot of vice presidents from New York in the first handful of decades. You get a lot of Virginians as president, and a lot of those Virginians have a New Yorker as vice president. Uh, the reason for this is... It's a swing state, and they want to win votes in New York. Now, New York is more, going more and more Democratic. They do end up putting John Jay in as governor for a little bit, but comes more Democratic-Republican over the years. Gaylord is one of those holdout Federalists, and, and out on the frontier, he's one of the few Federalists. It's actually really surprising he gets elected to the United States House of Representatives, but he does. And when he does, uh, he's there for one term, so basically two years. Uh, DeWitt Clinton, who would later be governor of New York and is kind of famous for the guy who made the, not made the Erie Canal, but the governor who oversaw the digging of the Erie Canal. At this point in 1803, he's still mayor of New York City, and he writes to Thomas Jefferson, a fellow Democratic Republican, talking about the Federalists who were just elected to office. And he uh, calls Gaylord and one other person, he calls them, quote, bitter and weak. Now, I don't think that this is supposed to mean he was a bitter person and just a, a weakling. I think it means politically. He is upset that the Democratic Republicans have not only been taking over the House of Representatives, but taking over the state of New York and seemingly taking over the presidency. Uh, and that's what made him bitter. But he was a low-level player when it came to politics in New York State. So that's why he's weak. So that's just a fun assessment of where Griswold is as he arrives. Now, once he gets there, this is a few years after, famously, Jefferson becomes president, but he ties with his vice presidential running mate, Aaron Burr. And obviously, okay, we need to change this thing. You know, you had Jefferson in one party, vice president to Adams in another party, and then you have two people from the same party who are arguing about who's actually president. We need to make some changes. And for whatever reason, which I was unable to determine how he got this job, but Gaylord Griswold was on the committee to, and then was the primary person to draft the 12th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which of course changed it so that when you cast a vote, you cast one vote for president and one vote for vice president instead of two votes for president, which was originally how the Constitution worked. Uh, now, Griswold... Uh, he did not do this on his own. He wrote, he wrote the draft, but then, of course, the draft went to committee, and they made some changes, and then the draft went to uh, the House of Representatives under the Committee of the Whole, which made changes. Then it went to the House of Representatives normally to vote on it. Then it went to the Senate, uh, and then it w goes around to all the states to get approval. So we don't want to give him 100% of the credit for coming up with the 12th Amendment. Hey, guys, let's do this, but... It is very cool, and it's really the fun fact of Griswold's life that he's the one who drafted the Constitution. Now, uh, he, he's there for just two years. Like I said, just one set, one term. Uh, he goes back to New York, continues his law career. Um, he ends up, he writes a letter that he passes around to the New York State Federalists. And it's really interesting because our next founder after this is going to be Morgan Lewis, who... We'll get to Morgan Lewis in a second, but Morgan Lewis was running for president for I'm sorry, governor of New York State against sitting vice president Aaron Burr. And Gaylord passes around a note to, uh, a note to Federalists. Uh, the Federalists were supporting Lewis. He had more moderate views. They thought they could get along better with him. Aaron Burr had just been criticized by head Federalist Alexander Hamilton. Uh, who was still alive at this point? Not for long, but uh, Aaron Griswold passed around a letter saying, why don't we vote for Burr? Obviously, although he doesn't have loyalties like, at, like Hamilton said, that probably means we can get him on our side if we want to. Now, 
unfortunately for Griswold, this letter gets out and the Democratic Republicans nationwide use it as a way to point at Griswold and be like, look, look at the Federalists. Look how they'll just do anything to win. They have no morals. It's the whole party is basically Aaron Burr when it's like, truthfully, the whole party was basically Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and so that's that. And that's really the end of his career which hurts because just a few years later in 1809 he's just 41 years old and passes away relatively suddenly uh so his already hampered career was certainly ended when his death arrived so they say it's gaylord griswold as i said a member of the really interesting griswold family um uh, i'm gonna take a sip of my water if you want, if we have time at the end, I could talk about the Matthew Lyon story, although I might do that for next week also. I am going to do James Wilkinson next week. I've gotten a bunch of requests for James Wilkinson recently, so look out for him coming probably this weekend. Uh, uh, but let's go on to founder number five, one, two, three, four, fifth, Morgan Lewis, as I said. So Morgan Lewis is a fascinating character um, for his place in the revolution. So Morgan Lewis comes of age... He actually studies law under John Jay, and John Jay is only like nine years older than he is. So, weird, weird. I guess not the weirdest situation, but you don't usually see people as young as John Jay tutoring other people in the law. But obviously, John Jay had a brilliant legal mind. That's why he jumped to the lead of the founders in his early 30s when the revolution was approaching. That's why he's the first Chief Justice of the United States. John Jay had a, an amazing mind, uh, arguably the best. Uh, uh, arguably the best legal mind in the United States um, in at its founding. Maybe James Wilson, but that's a story for another day. Lewis is able to study the law under John Jay because his dad's super rich. And you know what his dad's super rich's name was? Um, was is it, is it, is it, it's Francis. Francis. Francis Lewis, whose first name eluded me, but what I know for a fact about him is he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So Morgan Lewis has a dad signing the Declaration of Independence and a mom with a really fascinating story, though someone's called me out on this story recently um, saying that some of the sources are not perfect, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. I'll take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but we do know most of this. Most of this is fact. There are some parts that might be questionable. Uh, we will never know for sure, but his mother, Elizabeth, is uh, living on Long Island. What we would consider uh, Queens today, I believe, uh, in Whitestone, where there's a bridge now. His mother's living on the bridge, or, or on the bridge, living in Whitestone. His He's off studying law in New York City. His dad, well, no, I shouldn't say that, because Morgan joins the army, so he's not in New York City when the British invade. But his dad is off signing the Declaration in Philadelphia, and then the British arrive, and the British want to capture family members of Declaration signers. And his uh, mother, Elizabeth, is in her house, and the British start firing cannons from their ships at her house. And they blow a hole in the wall. And then Elizabeth stands in front of the wall where the hole is. And one of the servants, a.k.a. slaves, though in New York at the time they called them servants, uh, one of the servants says, what are you doing? <laughs> Get out of there. They just shot a hole in the wall. And as the story goes, Elizabeth says, a ball is not likely to strike the same place twice, which sounds really badass, and it is, but it's also true because the balls were being shot from cannons on boats that were moving in the water, so it probably would not hit the same place twice. Then the soldiers disembark and go into the house, and they go to take the buckles off her shoes, and the person who steals the gold from her shoes is very upset to learn it's not real gold, it's fake. And apparently, at this point, Elizabeth says, all that glitters isn't gold. Also, for a rich family to be so... I guess rich families back then were... I hope I don't offend anyone saying this, but I guess wealthy people back then were also very good at pinching pennies. <laughs> um, yeah, that's how you get rich, right? You save as much money as you can. Um, but they use gold... She had fake gold on her shoes? I don't know. Anyway, it seems weird to me. Elizabeth Lewis goes to prison. Now, allegedly, she was kept on a prison ship, though that's probably not true. They didn't usually keep women on prison ships, but it seems that she was kept in kind of poor conditions, and one of her servants ends up coming and giving her food through, like, the window bars. Now, 
George Washington gets word of several wives of important um, New Yorkers who are being kept in crappy conditions in New York City. And uh, basically, George Washington says to the British, uh, if you treat our women this way, we are going to treat your women significantly worse. Now, Washington says treat them the same. I shouldn't emphasize the story. We're going to treat them the same, which is terribly. Uh, and because of that, they put uh, Elizabeth Lewis, Morgan's mom, on parole. And she is able to go about her day in New York City but can't leave. And she, her health has been affected at this point. But one of her servants, the person who had came and, and given her food and clothing through the windows of the prison cell, uh, he falls ill. Uh, she, again, and now I can't confirm everything of this story, but she goes to take care of him like he took care of her. And he is dying. And she, now he is a Catholic which is very interesting that a slave in New York would have been a Catholic because there weren't many Catholics in New York really at all. Uh, it, as the story goes, she is able to write to the Continental Congress who get a preacher to come give him the last rites, who sneaks into New York City, a Catholic preacher, gives the slave last rites, and then sneaks back out of New York City. Now, that's the part of the story that personally I question the most. There's a lot of how was he Catholic? Maybe he was Catholic and then sold to someone in New York, which sadly did happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a lot. But either way, that's the story of Elizabeth Lewis. She then gets freed and goes down to Philadelphia where she meets her husband, her son, Morgan Lewis. And we're going to tell his story from the beginning. And uh, her new daughter-in-law, who is a Livingston. Morgan Lewis marries into the Livingston family, just like John Jay did, just like everyone who wanted to be super cool in New York did <laughs> marry the Livingston family. Uh, Alexander Hamilton married a Schuyler. You definitely marry a Schuyler if you can't get, I, I don't want to say this, I don't want this to sound wrong, uh, but you definitely would marry a Schuyler if you couldn't find a Livingston, is basically the best way I could put it. Um, anyway, Morgan Lewis is a young man, has just studied law, that's what his mom's doing. Meanwhile, he goes out and joins the Continental Army. Uh, he's very early actually appointed as a quartermaster, a deputy, a deputy quartermaster general in charge of the northern department. So he's in charge of making sure the soldiers are cl clothed and housed in the northern department under General Schuyler and during the invasion of Canada. Uh, he's pretty soon after also chosen as an aide-de-camp for General Horatio Gates. Um, uh, serves throughout the war and then goes back home and begins to study law, completes his study of law, uh, and very quickly in the 1780s becomes New York State's Attorney General. And he is Attorney General meant to carry out the laws of New York State for the first, for a decade. Until in 18, oh, I believe it was three, maybe four, might have been, oh, no, 1804, he decides to run for governor. And I know it's 1804 because the person he's running against. He runs for governor against the Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. And the reason the position of governor is open is because the guy with a short stint from John Jay, uh, the guy who had been governor of New York for 20 years through the whole revolution was George Clinton. And George Clinton just got called up by Thomas Jefferson to replace Aaron Burr. So Aaron Burr is running for governor of New York because the governor of New York is taking his place as vice president. Morgan Lewis steps in because he also wants that job. And as I mentioned earlier, Morgan Lewis kind of uh, the, the Democratic Republicans in this swing state of New York have started to take control, but that party itself splits. And what happens is Morgan Lewis recruits uh, Federalists to vote for him. And he becomes president. Now, in his, uh, I'm sorry, governor of New York. And during his three years as governor of New York, a lot happens. He does a lot to increase the infrastructure. Uh, he builds roads. Uh, he, he, the, New York becomes one of the first states to have public schools, though it's nothing like it is now. But the attitude was that, you know, we want everyone to get a certain base level of education in New York State so that New York State can just run appropriately. Uh, if everyone has a certain amount of education, then we should be super smart. And uh, New York City, which at this point was turning into New York City, uh, could turn into the New York City it became. Um, now, again, it was all of New York, did get some public schooling, but the focus was New York City primarily at this point, with Albany also should be uh, shouted out there. Now, three years later, he runs for re-election. This time, unfortunately for Lewis, he loses this election. The person he runs against is Daniel D. Tompkins, who we spoke about last week. Daniel D. Tompkins would later become Vice President of the United States. 
under James Monroe. So just to, just to clarify that. Morgan Lewis runs for president against the sitting vice president of the United States and wins. And then he runs against someone who would, would be vice president and loses. So he actually ran against two vice presidents for governor of New York. I assume that is a record that will never be broken. <laughs> Now, that's not the end of his story, though, because a few years later, the War of 1812 breaks out. And as I keep saying, like, a lot of the War of 1812 was a uh, naval war, including on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River, which surround New York State. The northern part of New York had naval wars, believe it or not. Uh, and a lot of the war was actually fought on the ground in New York State. The ground war, most of it took place in New York State. I know the famous one is when the British come and burn Washington, D.C., but most of the war took place in New York. Now, Lewis, uh, he is actually asked by President James Madison to become Secretary of War, to oversee the war. Lewis turns this down and instead is appointed as Quartermaster General of the United States Army, essentially the position he had decades earlier. He feels he'll be better at this position because he had more experience in it from the Revolutionary War. And uh, since it is kind of an administrative position, he was a governor of New York. And he thought he could move supplies and house troops better in New York than anywhere else. Furthermore, he's then appointed by Madison as a major general in the United States Army. And he leads soldiers in several battles in New York State. Now, he is given a little bit of, um, uh, 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 not trouble, but kind of a wave of the finger. Uh, there's a battle of Fort George that they win, uh, but then he tells Winfield Scott, who is an, a really important general, who ends up being like the commanding general of the army for like 30 years. <laughs> um, uh, but at this point, Winfield Scott is a younger man. Uh, Winfield Scott wants to keep going and capture the major general leading the British army. Uh, Lewis says no, he's being more reserved, and he doesn't want to risk it, and says no. In hindsight, he probably should have let Scott go do that, would have really ended the war immediately, and been a more um, stupendous victory, instead of the kind of like, all right, let's just stop fighting now, which the Treaty of Ghent ended up being. Can we just stop having this war? Okay, we're all done here. Um, it would have been a decisive victory had he let them do that. So he, uh, military historians do kind of give a wag of the finger at Lewis for that. But I also should note, Morgan Lewis by this point had made a vast fortune. And he spends most of it feeding and supplying the army and his men and fighting the War of 1812. And furthermore, he ends up as a... Do I want to say it? Is it him? Yes. Uh, as a major landowner in New York, which still had a lot of feudal tendencies, as I like to say, you know, um, a few people owned all the land and rented it out to most farmers, you know, not just own, not just slaves, which did exist in New York, but wasn't like in the South. Um, but like every farmer essentially rented their land at this point. That would end in 1840 with the riots. But he actually gave a discount on rent to people who lived on his land if they went and fought in the war. Uh, it was his way of getting people to fight, and it was his way of paying back the soldiers that defended New York State and the United States of America. He is probably the only American founder who is more famous than his father who signed the Declaration of Independence. That's not true. Ah, uh, you know what? I wrote that in the article. That's not true. William Henry Harrison is famous. He was a president of the United States. Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too. His dad also signed the Declaration of Independence. So, okay, he's the second most famous founder who's more famous than their father who signed the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> hey, Jesse, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, any questions? You know, that's what we're here for. Let's move on. we got two more guys. Running a little bit long, but that's all right, are we? Yeah, we're going to run a little bit over. And that's okay because we're having fun here. I'm going to take a sip of water, though, because I'm starting to sweat. When I said sip, I meant gulp. Whammy. Um, Gideon Granger. Okay, so. Gideon Granger should be famous for being Postmaster General of the United States and just massively increasing the scope of the post office. Unfortunately, he's ended up being famous for 
uh, a law he pushed through which made things even worse for black people than they already were at the time. But let's get into it. So Gideon Granger is another person from Connecticut. We've done a lot of Connecticut today. Um, I will avoid Connecticut next week, I promise you. Gideon Granger from Connecticut, um, he, like um, uh, 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 Gaylord Griswold, uh, okay, so Gideon Granger and Gaylord Griswold are two founders I did this week. Their names are both G and G, are their initials. They're both started their life in Connecticut and ended up in New York. That's really weird. I just made that connection. So come with me. <laughs> Gideon Granger, uh, he comes of age just like Gaylord did, right as the Revolutionary War ends. So he doesn't really participate in the war itself, but he studies law, he is quickly elected to the Connecticut Assembly, um, and he is brilliant. Brilliant. In his early 20s, he's, connected, he's elected to the Connecticut Assembly. And what's interesting is, despite living in a heavily Federalist state of Connecticut, he is a Democratic Republican. And as a young man, he starts writing anonymously, but he writes pamphlets supporting Jeffersonian democracy and extolling the virtues of it. And it makes him a rising star in the party. People find out who it is, and he becomes a rising star in the Democratic Party. By 1798, he is still not even 30, and he runs for the United States House of Representatives. Now, he's defeated in his race for House of Representatives, but three years later, President Jefferson has taken office, and he's looking for people to fill his cabinet. And he reaches out to Gideon Granger to act as Postmaster General, which he accepts. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, it's like he's one of the few Federalists in Connecticut, uh, and Jefferson brings him in. Now, he would serve for the entirety of the Jefferson administration and three quarters of the Madison administration. He serves for uh, thir 14 years as Postmaster General, making him the longest serving Postmaster General in United States history. And the first most important thing when he was Postmaster General was the Louisiana Purchase. Because now the United States is way bigger and they all need to receive mail. Granted, most of the Louisiana Purchase was extraordinarily remote. Like this is the same time Lewis and Clark are first going out on their expedition to the West, which takes two years. And there's Native Americans living out there, of course, but not a lot of people you got to send letters to. That being said, New Orleans is a major city already. It's the big prize of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, additionally, St. Louis is, is a small camp. There's a bunch of small camps on the other side of the Mississippi River, but they all need now to be brought in and communicated with. Uh, he does some things that are a little controversial at the time. He tries to, uh, he hires like outside help, essentially contractors, which people don't love. Um, but he is able to very quickly, massively expand what the post office was doing. Fortunately, part of his expanding was a major setback for black people in the United States. Again, things already weren't great for black people in the United States. Um, one of the few things that black people did was deliver correspondence. Uh, even enslaved people would deliver correspondence. One of the I won't use the word perks, obviously, but one of the re of the many things a master would have a slave do would be to deliver melt letters. Why would I go deliver it when I could have an employee do it for me? Is essentially the thinking. So even enslaved black people would get on a horse and ride away and deliver a letter and ride back. Um, usually. Uh, primarily it was free black people because this was one of the jobs that they could have that would, you know, further their career. They could be very successful at it. However, not only had the Haitian Revolution broken out, which for those who are not familiar, it was a, uh, uh, what we now call Haiti was then known as Saint-Domingue, uh, was a, a French colony that had a handful of white people and mostly black slaves. Not America paid pales in comparison to the percentage of black it was like 95 percent of the people were black slaves uh in, or enslaved black people so uh when they had a riot and went to overthrow their government it was pretty easy in haiti for toussaint l'ouverture to actually successfully do that now the american i guess easy is a tough word it was several years of war but it, it was done then it was the first independent republic uh primarily run by black people, which is amazing. Uh, unless you're Gideon Granger 
and the American government at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, additionally, in Virginia, Gabriel's Rebellion had recently broken out. And Gabriel's Rebellion is interesting, too, because Gabriel was a slave who got a few other slaves. He, many slaves, as I said, they were allowed to go out and deliver letters, but they were also usually rented out, many of them, if they were highly skilled in any artisan or craft, they would be rented out to other workers to make more money for their master. And uh, Gabriel was one of these slaves. He's sometimes called Gabriel Prosser because they give him uh, his master's last name, but he never really went by that. It's just a way to differentiate him from the thousands of other Gabriels throughout history. Um, but uh, Gabriel was rented out on several occasions. It would work uh, doing certain jobs with other white people who, and these other white people doing the same jobs as him, he would hear them talk and they would talk about the American Revolution and liberty and uh, the, the Constitution and freedoms. Uh, and he wanted that. And Gabriel actually gets a bunch of other uh, slaves together and they have a revolt in Virginia. I want to say Richmond. Uh, I forget the exact city they're in, but they have a revolt. It doesn't go well. Uh, First of all, they get, it gets rained out the first time, and then some. They, he's basically given up before it starts by, by other slaves who don't want to get caught and get executed, um, and it doesn't work out. But it was terrifying to many people uh, that the slaves would revolt and just kill, kill all the white people, which would objectively would not have been great for anyone. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but the thinking was, Gideon's thinking was, well, if we have black people riding on horses from town to town and we're letting them do this, then one uh, smart, able black person could go literally across the country and tell all of the slaves in all of the colonies, hey, on this day, we're all going to riot. We're all going to rebel. They can't suppress us all. Um, now... I don't know of that actually being passed around. I don't know of that ever actually happening. But Granger was afraid of that. And he was able to convince all of Congress to be afraid of that. And he got them to pass a law that said, do I have the quote here? Um, yes, quote, only, quote, a free white person should be able, should be employed delivering mail. And it, as I said, it's really hard to imagine that... Uh, uh, Black people in early American history could have things get worse, but they did. Uh, and, and this is how it happened. It, it took away one of the few jobs that a free black person could have and that uh, uh, enslaved black people could do. I know they weren't liberated, but, you know, part of being an American, getting in your car and driving around being free, they had... I don't want anything I do to sound like I'm apologizing for slavery or trying to justify slavery, um, but being able to ride off on a horse as a slave, I would presume was a, um, um, a respite from usual day-to-day -day labor. Uh, that being said, um, uh, they could no longer do that. And I should also note, things would get worse for black people because it's about the time that the cotton gin was starting to become really popular and uh, slavery, which many people thought would kind of die out naturally uh, in favor of industrialization, uh, kind of gets gung-ho again. And then, you know, we got a, about 60 years to the Civil War. But uh, I've rambled on a little bit now. <laughs> I always get a little nervous when I'm talking about slavery. Um, never want to say the wrong thing. Uh, Gideon Granger unfortunately did say the wrong thing. <laughs> he uh, convinced Congress to make it so only white people could deliver the mail. Uh, that is, and then he ends up moving to upstate New York, actually not far from me, uh, in Canandaigua, and his home is still there. It's the Gideon, the Granger Museum, which I have not yet frequented, but I hope to very, very soon. So this is Gideon Granger. Why don't we get out of that? People have left <laughs> while we've been discussing here, and we've also already surpassed an hour, so we've got a little over our time. Let's talk about John Filson, another person who could take me a long time, and the only person today not from Connect Die Cut. So that's good. Uh, John Filson uh, was a smart young man. He went to the West Nottingham Academy, which I believe was in Maryland. Uh, uh, it was for children to get educated, uh, wealthy children, and many future founders would end up going there and graduating and going on to other things. When he's in his late 20s, Filson joins the Revolutionary War. He signs up. He's, he's a low-ranking officer. He goes, joins the New York, New Jersey campaign, and is unfortunately captured 
though fortunately released because most people captured during that campaign go on prison ships and don't come back so he is released um he, he leaves the war effort after that he's had enough after his imprisonment uh and that's fine uh 1783 the war is coming to an conclusion philson is ready for an adventure and he goes west he goes over the appalachians and he goes to kentucky while he's in kentucky uh, he travels around a little bit and learns as much as he can about Kentucky. And then he decides, I'm going to publish a book. And he writes a book called The Discovery, Settlement, and Present State of Kentucky. And side note, he spells Kentucky with an E at the end and not a Y. I don't know why. I guess that's how this sounds. That's how they spelled it then. Whatever. i got to take a quick sip of water. Excuse me. What's really interesting about this book is the end. The end of a book sometimes has appendices. And the appendices are supposed to make it uh, add context to the rest of the book. He has an appendice that's longer than the book itself. And this part is about a gentleman he has met and become friends with. Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone is an American founder in his own right. Not only had he cut through the Cumberland Gap, the Wilderness Road out west, while the American Revolution was beginning, he ends up fighting in the Revolutionary War. He ends up being elected to the uh, Virginia House of Representatives alongside james madison he's there in the building when thomas jefferson is governor so like he is um boone is among the founders um but he wasn't that famous at the time that being said john filson writes this big old appendix to his book which becomes the most popular part of his book now this book goes and it's viral so to speak uh it's wildly successful people purchase it all over the united states uh, and it helps convince many of them, if they weren't already convinced to go settle the frontier, now they are ready to do so. And they choose Kentucky, because John Filson over here. Additionally, this because this book is so successful, that's why Daniel Boone becomes famous. Daniel Boone is so famous in American history that many people don't even realize he was a real person. Uh, he, you know, he's not Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan, not real. Daniel Boone, totally real. Anyway... Uh, people start moving west. Uh, Filson makes a good amount of living uh, from this. And then he goes north. See, he he was making money a variety of ways. He was a school teacher. He was a surveyor, this and that. So he goes, he's hired to go survey a portion of Ohio where the Ohio and uh, Licking Rivers meet. He goes there and he surveys it. He buys one third of the land. He's one of the major investors in it. And he names the place Los Santiville. And I don't remember what it was, but Los Santiville is a combination of like French, Spanish, and Greek or something like that. I don't remember what it means. Um, but he names it Los Santiville and he tries to recruit people to go there. Uh, he lays out the basics of the town. Um, and then he goes on a hunting excursion, not a hunt, a, a surveying trip with his crew. And they are attacked by Native Americans. And this is Ohio Valley region, just as the French and Indian War is breaking out in the area. So he is kidnapped and never heard from again, unfortunately. Um, and what's really sad is he dies before they change the name of Los Santiville. It was just two years after he surveyed it, they changed the name. <laughs> oh, man. I'm ruining the big moment here. They changed the name of Filson's Los Santiville to Cincinnati. I know Cincinnati isn't the sexiest name of a city for me to throw out there, but they do have several professional sports teams because they are a major metropolitan area and have been very important to the development of the United States. And anyone from Cincinnati who, or who has been through Cincinnati, the heart of downtown was originally laid out by John Filson, the same guy who made Daniel Boone uber famous. That is the story of John Filson. I need this of water. I'm like joking on myself. Joking over here. And that's it, Founder fans. Thank you for coming. That was the seven stories from the last week. I really appreciate you guys hitting out, hitting like. If you're still here, you want to hit like, uh, that would be amazing. Um, I do this every week. Tomorrow we are, oh, tomorrow um, we are playing trivia. Trivia might be late tomorrow. I, I'm not entirely sure. My spouse, oh, some animals fighting outside. <laughs> okay. Um... Uh, trivia might be late tomorrow. I apologize. Uh, my spouse is has to work at a uh, booth at a local baseball game, our, our local Syracuse Mets. Um, so she might not be back until later, maybe. So trivia might not be until like 9.15, even 9.30 tomorrow. Um, so I do apologize for that. I still plan on doing it. And many of you have showed interest in me doing more live videos, talking about different 
uh, TV shows and stuff about the American Revolution. I want to do that. I'm figuring out what to do and, and like when to do it and how to go about it. Um, I know I did a thing on the Hamilton play a while ago, but honestly, that might be the easiest place to start because I can just listen to the songs and talk about it as we go. Um, uh, let me know if you have any ideas on how to go about that. I was considering either... I want to do it on YouTube. I was considering either doing it on Twitch or like right on the Discord channel. So I don't know uh, how what the easiest way, best way to do it is. Um, but let me know what you think. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and we will end as we end every week with Round Bottom.